Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our energy conversations at the ANU Energy Change Institute. Uh, my name is Ken Baldwin, and I'm director of the ANU Energy Change Institute, and it's my pleasure to act as the moderator for today's energy conversations. Uh, and uh, uh, before we uh, go into the webinar itself, uh, I'd like to just first of all acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So today's uh, energy conversations uh, will be uh, around developments in community-based energy storage. And we have two speakers from the ANU Energy Change Institute uh, who will present uh, on these uh, important topics. And we will follow their two presentations with uh, two people who will act as discussants on their talks. Uh, and we will then uh, open up the uh, entire webinar to questions. I will. Uh, field some questions uh, between the discussants and the speakers to start with, and then I'll invite questions from the audience. Uh, this is a public event and media may be present. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be shared later on the ANU TV YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, if you are an attendee for the first time and are using perhaps Zoom for the first time, uh, let me just explain that you have the opportunity to ask questions. Down the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A button which you can press and that opens up a dialog box in which you can ask a question. Uh, there's also a chat button where you can share your thoughts with everybody who's on the meeting. I see now that we have 236 participants, which is great. Uh, that's uh, a very good sized meeting uh, and uh, shows the value uh, of reaching out in these uh, electronic uh, presentations at times uh, when it's clearly not possible for us to all get together. So that's a terrific response from uh, everybody in the audience. Uh, so just to go through that again, uh, we'll have a presentation by our two guest speakers from the ANU Energy Change Institute. We will then have an opportunity for our two discussants to comment on what they've said. Uh, we will then have a discussion amongst the panel of four speakers and that will be followed by Q&A from you, the audience, uh, that we will moderate and put to the speakers. And we aim to have a wrap-up time of around 1 p.m. Um, but if, uh, of course, there's great interest, we can maybe continue a little longer. All right, so I think that's pretty much it uh, for the formalities. Uh, so now I would like to uh, introduce the first of our two speakers. Uh, Marnie Shaw is a research leader in the ANU Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program, uh, which is part of the Energy Change Institute's uh, 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 portfolio of activities. And uh, Marnie is also a convener of the Institute's Energy Efficiency Research Cluster. So Marnie, I would now like to uh, introduce you uh, to uh, present your talk as part of the energy conversation. Thanks so much, Ken, to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Can you see the screen, Ken, and can you hear me okay? Yep, but you're in presenter view. Ah, so I'll just switch it around. Okay, how's that? And you're still in presenter view. Ah. Sorry, I'll just reshare. Mm. 
Is that right? Uh, yes, there we go. Thank you. Hey, sorry about that, everyone. Okay, um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. It's, it's really great and exciting to see so much interest in this topic. And thanks, Ken, for the invitation. So, um, uh, as Ken said, I'm Marnie Shaw. I'm a research leader in the Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program at the ANU. And at the core of our program, we have a focus on doing engineering and social research side by side. Um, that's because the technical solutions that we develop will only work if you consider at the same time the people who will be using them. So our talks today are an example of that. So I'll talk about community batteries from an engineering perspective and Heather will speak from a social, res social research perspective. And I think that after you hear both the talks together side by side, you'll be convinced of why this collaborative approach is so important in this field. So I just wanna mention some of our project partners. I think some of them might be tuned into the webinar. So thanks very much. These industry-wide collaborations are really integral to the success of this work. So we really appreciate their participation. So the idea of community batteries has been around for a while. But in Australia, we've seen really over the past year or so that the ideas really started to attract a lot of interest. And that interest is not just from community energy advocates, but now also from the industry more broadly, including networks, regulators, and even the market operator, AEMO. And the reason why community batteries are really gaining um, this attention is because they can provide a lot of different services for different stakeholders. So it can provide storage for customers in potentially a cheaper way because of economies of scale, but they can also provide the kind of support for the grid that we increasingly need as we're adding more and more solar generation from our rooftops. And at the same time, shared energy assets like community batteries might be a good way to address some of the energy equity issues that we need to be mindful of as we transition to a low carbon energy system. And Hedda will speak a little bit more about that after me. So what do we actually mean by community batteries? Really, we're talking about scale. So batteries that are on the order of 10 to 100 times larger than your typical household battery that you might buy. And they would be shared between more than one user and sit in front of the meter. So typically on the low voltage network. So you can imagine something um, like this, I'll just try to get a um, pointer. So something like this on the right, uh, which is a little shipping container. You can imagine it would be a shipping container like this in the green space, some, in some green space in your sub suburb. And we see now that quite a few companies are bringing storage of this scale to the market. So in practice, community batteries are already being trialled in Australia, but only in Western Australia. Here's one on the right that's in Alcamos Beach in Western Australia. And the reason why they can be trialled there um, a bit more easily is because their electricity network operators are government owned. So they're governed by different rules compared to our privatised system over here on the East Coast. In practice, it means that it's difficult for networks to own a battery here on the East Coast because they're not allowed to buy and sell energy directly to customers. So that brings me to the central question that we're trying to answer with our research into community batteries. Is there a way to operate a community battery on the East Coast? And who would own such a battery and what rules might need to be changed, if any? So some of the specific questions that we're looking at are, are there feasible models for ownership and operation of community batteries across Australia? If yes, which are optimal? And then um, very importantly, do the batteries actually solve the main problem that we need them to solve? And that is allowing us to increase the amount of renewable energy like rooftop solar that's being integrated into the system. This is what we call hosting capacity. And finally, we're investigating a possible real world demonstration of a community battery. And we're doing that in partnership with ACG government and 
speaking with our local network operator, Evo Energy. Um, the project is planned for a new suburb called Jacka that has mandated every house to have solar PV. So of course, that's a really great thing. And it's driven by ACT government's ambitious and world-leading decarbonisation program, but it can create a challenge for our local grid. So the goal of this trial would be to work out whether community batteries provide a good way to support um, very high solar PV penetration. So how do we actually answer these questions? Um, we've built some software, it's open source software called C3X to model the behaviour of um, distributed energy resources, DER, and the impact that they'd have on the distribution grid. So basically for our model, we consider a sub-region of the distribution network that's shown here. Um, we call it a local energy system and that's connected to the wider grid that's shown here. So we can flexibly model households who have solar um, generation, who have a battery um, or households with, with no um, DER. And we can also add into our model a uh, community battery, as you see here. So um, then we can calculate for a given number of houses and for a given amount of solar generation, for a given battery size and operation, what's the impact on the energy flows in our system? Uh, and what's the impact on the aggregate energy flowing into and out of our local energy system? And from that, we can work out the economics. So how much do the households pay for their electricity? How much revenue does the battery make or how much loss? And money made from the battery trading directly on the energy market shown here. And we can also estimate the technical impact of the battery. How much local, so local solar energy can it soak up and how well can it provide grid support? So I'm not going to go into any more technical detail, but um, if you're interested in finding out more, you could read our technical reports or feel very free to get in, in contact with us. So we have some early results. Um, we've been trying out different models of ownership and operation, and we do find that there are feasible models. So this slide shows the cost benefit result for one of our models where the battery is owned by a third party. It could be, for example, a local council. Um, and we included in the revenue a payment from the network for the service it provides that's shown here in orange. This simulation is for 200 households over a whole month of January in 2018 for a battery size of 500 kilowatt hours, 250 kilowatts. So you can see that the revenue for the battery is slightly higher than the cost and the customer savings are about twice the cost um, of the battery itself. So this works out for 200 customers to be about $15 per day. And we've also seen that the community battery can increase the amount of solar energy that can be generated by households in our model. So the orange bars here show the total energy imported from the wider grid to our households. And the yellow bars show the total energy exported from our households to the wider grid. So these energy exports in the yellow bars are what are really causing networks headaches at the moment, and we need them to be reduced. So we can see that household batteries um, do a good job in reducing the energy exports. They reduce by about 25%, but then the community battery does an even better job. It reduces the exports by a factor of about 50%. So I'm going to wrap up there um, and I'll finish by coming back to our main question. Is there a way to operate a community battery outside of Western Australia? Our work suggests that there is and it might provide a good solution for integrating more renewable energy into our grid. So I want to just finish by thanking our project partners um, and also by thanking ARENA for funding this work. So thanks very much. This is our BizGIP program at the ANU. Thanks everyone. Terrific, thank you Marnie. And uh, we will now move on to the second speaker in our energy conversation. And that is Dr. Hedda Ransom-Cooper. 
Edda is a research fellow also in the battery storage and grid integration program here at ANU uh, as part of the Energy Change Institute. And uh, she leads the social science part of that program. Uh, she works with colleagues uh, from a range of different disciplines and uh, is looking to understand and facilitate the transition to a more sustainable electricity grid. So I'll now hand over to Hedda. Thank you, Ken. And I think that um, I'm having some help here with the screen sharing. Wonderful. Um, thank you. And Paris, I'll just let you know when, um, when it's time to go to the next slide. Um, so thank you, Ken, for the invitation. It's a real um, delight to be able to have the opportunity to share this research because we're coming towards the end of the project. And so it's really exciting for us to be able to actually share some of our results um, from all this work that we've been doing sort of behind the scenes. Um, so within Biscuit, the social science team, I guess we explore the sort of cultural, social, political questions surrounding um, the energy transition that is underway. Um, we're focused on how this, how this future is unfolding and we're working sort of with our technical co colleagues to ask some quite kind of fundamental questions about what it is that we need from our energy systems and who are we creating these systems for. Um, this project does exactly that. Um, we could have just looked at sort of local storage owned by a network um, and not really looked at how the community would be involved. But right from the outset, we were kind of interested in questions around access and affordability and sort of enabling people who are otherwise excluded currently from renewables to be able to kind of engage more um, in the renewable transition. We discovered pretty early on that this is a very, obviously it's a new technology, so we don't really know what it is that people think of it. Um, there's not a lot of research on sort of the idea of a shared battery. What do people think of it? Um, how could the community be involved? Could this be a future technology in our energy system? So you'll get a sense as I go through the presentation that this is quite a substantive piece of work. Um, and this presentation is really just a taste of our findings. There's a lot, lot more um, that we've got that we'd love to kind of share with you if you're, if you're further interested. So I guess essentially what we found was that people agreed that community batteries could be part of sol solving the energy trilemma, um, but they were focused on different benefits and different risks. Um, so this makes pathways forward in terms of what models we go with an inherently sort of political question requiring, requiring some thought and, and um, some investment in terms of thinking about what kinds of processes could we put in place to kind of make some of these decisions. Uh, so next slide. All right, so here's your sort of one minute of uh, social science theory. So social acceptance, what, what is this? It's essentially a bundle of decisions that get made at different scales. Um, so engineers, policy makers, special interest groups collectively influence what's seen as technologically possible. And households are involved in this as well, obviously with the sort of distributed energy systems that we have available now. They in turn are influenced by media, their friends, their experiences in the world. So up here on the slide, you'll see the sort of, ex sort of research questions we're exploring in the project. We look for points of tension between different actors in the energy system, points of agreement um, about, about essentially the benefits and the risks of, of um, community storage. So from what we understand about technological change, to be successful, community storage would either have to fit within the ele existing electricity system if it can't do so, it's got to sort of stretch and transform it in some way. So I think, I guess what we found is that local storage could fit within the current framework, as Marnie mentioned, um, it, it, could poss it could definitely work with, with sort of pretty minimal to no regulatory changes. Um, but what you'll see in the rest of the presentation is that community concerns about the nature of the electricity system means that there is the possibility for this to be a bit more disruptive. Um, so in terms of how would we go about looking at these questions about what, what is it that people think about local storage, usually um, we, we would do a combination of things, desktop analysis, looking at um, sort of different stakeholders, their submissions, what they've put, 
policy documents, what they've put out there about what they think about um, a technology. But because community storage is so new, um, we actually had to go and, and speak to people um, um, and get, get the story from the horse's mouth, um, so to speak. So next slide. So what did we do? Well, first of all, in terms of the energy, we spoke with energy professionals and we spoke with people in the community. So in terms of the energy professionals, we started with our project partners to get a sense of um, their thoughts uh, about local storage. And that's because they already had a, an investment and an, an idea of what, what they thought local storage could do. So we spoke with them for an hour or so. We then cast our net wider and ran two focus groups in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, so participants, as you can see here, came sort of from a variety of different parts of the sector, consumer advocacy, government at all levels. Um, we had um, a, a good, good bunch of networks and retailers as well. Um, in terms of the gender split, um, we couldn't, though we tried to get sort of 50-50, we, you know, we couldn't quite get there. And um, sadly, it's a bit of a reflection of, of, the, of the sector um, as, as well. Um, so then we, um, next slide, uh, we went out and did some focus groups out in the community. So in total, we spoke with 52 people in eight different locations. And here, we were really just aiming to get um, diversity. So rural, urban, um, you'll see, um, well, it's not always easy to see, but yeah, so we spoke in Melbourne, for instance, with people from culturally and linguistically diverse part of, um, part of Melbourne. We also wanted to hear from residential battery owners to see what they thought about this idea. Um, and so here we can see we got a bit of a better gender mix. Um, we did also have some representation from renters and, and, and apartment owners usually people excluded from the energy, renewable energy transition. Um, but the majority of our sample were homeowners and um, lived in, in, in houses. Um, over, bit over, just a little bit over half were um, owners of PV. Um, we'd also really like to do a, a focus group in Broome to get an Indigenous perspective on, on this topic. Um, but we've been a bit slowed down with that with COVID. So we're still hoping to run that group, but we... Um, the, that analysis is not going to be part of this presentation. Uh, next slide. So in terms of energy professionals, what did they think? Um, overall, they saw a huge range of benefits that local storage could provide. Um, 18 separate benefits um, that we, we, we found, um, which is, you know, quite, quite something for such an innocuous um, grey box is an image that you can see on the, on the, on the presentation. So everything from sort of stabilising the grid, avoiding network upgrades, improving access of renewables to the general community, and even maybe building trust in the NEM. So unsurprisingly, different parts of the sector emphasise different benefits. State governments emphasised accessibility, lowering emissions, whereas networks were concerned about reducing network costs. This is important because it will be impossible to design a model that can achieve all of those benefits sort of at the same time. There's going to have to be trade-offs. Um, it was very clear through our discussions with uh, energy sector professionals that there would likely be different models of local storage depending on a whole raft of factors. And of course, there were concerns, caveats and challenges that participants identified practical issues like maintenance, installation standards, and then challenges around governance, such as ring fencing. Um, none of these were deemed insurmountable. Uh, next slide. So here's Gary from local government saying, are we just trying to achieve the fact that there are people out there who are pushing the idea because it suits their economic benefit, or are we putting it out there because it actually helps the electricity system? So what this quote demonstrates is, I think that it's very important to have the conversation about what the storage is for and, and who it benefits in the energy system. Um, there's already some concern, for instance, that PV policies have led to this emergence of a divide between sort of solar haves and have nots. Um, and so it's important that issues around access and how the savings will be distributed are sort of tackled head on when we have this conversation about local storage. Um, quite a few participants mentioned that local government 
um, with their renewable targets might make them the sort of first movers in this space. But networks are another obvious sort of group because of the urgency of the technical constraints in some parts of the network that um, Marnie mentioned already. So what emerged was that we find that local context is important in terms of designing what kind of model might suit. But the energy sector is not used to operating in this way. It means that there's transaction costs in terms of developing the models. Um, so we need to have a conversation about, about that. Overall, a big tick, uh, this is very sort of energy sector, but very big tick to trials and demonstrations. Everybody agreed that that would be a good way to kind of see um, whether this could be workable in the future. Uh, next slide. So what did the community say? Well, they had a lot to say about all of this. Um, overall, local storage was seen also very positively, although, um, and, and sort of some of the participants actually had a very sophisticated understanding of the technical um, benefits, but I guess their focus was more on enabling, on the fact that it would enable more renewables in the system. Um, it, would be, it would be local and that they would have greater control over their energy systems. So as Julie says, I imagine myself, if there was some sort of community battery scenario, I'd feel I had a lot more power over my usage and that would be really attractive. So the battery in terms of improving reliability, so in an outage was sort of less front of mind for most participants, most people, um, even though we, we have a couple of groups who do experience reliability issues, um, their focus was really more on the sort of the renewable side of things. Uh, next slide. So um, really, I guess the emphasis that I wanted to make here was that what, what people really got excited about and what people really talked about was that the issues that they have with the governance of, of, of our energy system in, in Australia. So as Margaret says, community batteries, uh, sorry, as Margaret says, I think we do need to have a conversation or a real debate about whether we do want to see electricity as a social good not necessarily just as an individual um, individual good. So I guess community batteries do provide a different way to relate to energy and people really liked the idea of a collective ownership of, of renewables. Um, so ownership really was critical, um, which is partly why I suppose local councils, again, third party, not-for-profit retailers, nursing homes, schools, these were the kinds of institutions that people thought would be good um, to manage the battery. They didn't really see the community themselves as being ideal sort of um, custodians of the battery um, because of, you know, there's not a lot of templates, I suppose, for decision-making of community assets to be a kind of an enjoyable or, a, or an easy process. People didn't have a lot of positive experiences about that. Um, and you could also sort of argue that I guess local government has had a lot of issues in, in recent years in terms of sort of issues of corruption and so on. But I suppose it was seen still by and large as, as a more trusted institution that could be seen to manage the, the battery. Unsurprisingly, people wanted whatever scheme or whatever model to be sort of simple and understandable and demonstrate that the environmental impact is positive. So this came through a lot more strongly than say with the energy sector professionals. People really wanted to be shown that the battery um, didn't come from, um, or sorry, sourcing the materials of the battery didn't pose risks in terms of human rights abuses or, um, or sort of negative environmental impacts. So the life cycle of the battery, things like that. Um, risks around things like fire and so on were thought to be very manageable. Um, people did raise them, but they weren't sort of very concerned about risks like that. So next slide. So I suppose there are multiple possible models of community batteries um, that might suit different types of contexts and communities. And the process that, we, that is used to come to each model is critical. The community must be involved. Um, so what we saw was that regulatory challenges could be overcome, but sort of broader questions of politics and governance might be more challenging. We also saw, you know, in a context where we see that prosumers are edging away from the grid, there's narratives of self-sufficiency signalling a desire to kind of disconnect from the system that came through quite strongly um, in, our, in our discussions. 
But our research also shows that the opposite can be true. Households are excited about the idea of being grid connected through local storage. Because it's renewable, it's local, it could be community, um, and people talked about keeping money in the community as, as well. But within our current system, lack of consistent policy settings around this mean that there's a potential for um, exclusion. So what about communities where there isn't a local government or a network that wants to support the battery? So these kind of bigger picture questions around access are ones that we really need to kind of uh, to talk about. And I just wanted to leave you with one little quote from one participant. Um, uh, a lot of the time the community voice isn't heard and I hope that the sort of um, some of the bits of um, quotes and, and, and discussion that I brought up today showed that, that the community are really sort of interested in engaging on these issues um, and that this, this, is, this can be a really valuable voice um, um, in our conversations about energy. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank finally Arena, our funder, and, and thank you, of course, to all of our participants um, for making this research possible. And I might um, end there. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Hedda. And uh, we now have uh, two discussants who would uh, uh, now like to present their perspectives on uh, Marnie and Hedda's presentations. Uh, the first discussant is Heather Smith. Heather is studying the social dimensions of community storage via microgrids in South Australia, where she's undertaking a PhD at the University of Adelaide. Uh, so I'd now like to uh, hand over to Heather to uh, hear her perspectives. Thanks, Ken. I'm actually at the University of South Australia and um, my PhD aims to sit between the social and the technical. So I have an electrical engineering background. Um, and I'm also the chair of the Coalition for Community Energy. So this is really interesting research uh, for us and, and looking at what communities themselves are pushing for when it comes to change in the energy system. So I've got a few uh, quick points to make and some questions, really, they, they lead to questions. You know, the first um, thing that jumps to mind is this tension between collective interest and uh, individual interest. And I've always been, been um, thinking that we need to put a, a value on diversity. And Marnie's slide shows that quite clearly, where she shows that um, if you uh, look at the cost of individual household batteries um, you, and the value that produces, you sort of only get half the value that you get if you put those all the same households together in a collective. Um, and, and we see that with our street transformers you know you you might have 200 kilowatts at the end of the street but if the network had a, had to build for each of you having your peak demand at exactly the same time they would have built 400 kilowatts and that diversity factor is about 50 percent and the the networks have always captured that collective value and um and, and made the most of it for our community but of course things are changing you know we a few years ago, we never talked about hosting capacity. That 200 kilowatt um, uh, transformer doesn't give you 200 kilowatts of exports. There's a whole lot of issues with voltages on your system. And so you might only get 60 kilowatts of, of exports, 60 kilowatts hosting capacity on your system. So thinking about some of those things that, that define what gets delivered to your home and how they get, uh, how the value can be improved locally and collectively, I think is a really interesting discussion that you've, you've um, developed here. Uh, if we look at some of Eleanor Ostrom's work on um, governance of the commons, she showed that um, many communities governed their commons effectively. They, and one of the keys was the way individuals felt um, they had a say in how the system was governed they had a say in what constituted a fair distribution of value. Um, and there was a system for um, helping people that strayed outside of the, the, um, the social contract to, to come back in, you know, punishing, punishing offenders who use too much water, for example. So um, I, I'm really interested to, to see us uh, developing that idea of 
what collective governance could work. And I'd, I'd be interested if both of you would talk a little bit more to that in a while, um, because we've all heard an awful story about getting tangled up in a strata development where you can't get something happening or, you know, there's particular personalities involved. So there's plenty of research on local governance that doesn't work and is dysfunctional. And I think it's, it, it, it's time for us to work out what institutions really support us to do that local element properly. So the local circumstances point was another one that you picked up on. Um, you, you know, we are in a, a space of change and efficiency is a characteristic of lean machines, lean businesses that work very efficiently and capture all the value, but they're also brittle and they're not good at adapting to change. And having um, the idea that when we develop community batteries and community energy systems, that the systems are going to have to be what each individual community needs, it's sort of an acceptance that we're going to have to be less efficient about this. We're going to have to have more conversations and more deliberation. And we see it in the community energy sector. You know, we have 100 groups and many of them have gone in different directions as they've all tried to work out what, their, what is right for their community in developing a community energy um, uh, system. So, um, one of the areas that I'm interested in you perhaps answering some questions about is um, the now versus the future. You know, when you ask people about community batteries, how far into the future do we allow them to imagine? If we only imagine them in the context of today's electricity system, we're limiting ourselves and not thinking about the electric vehicles around the corner and the the fact that we might bring more heating loads onto our system, which all have a sense of storage themselves. And, and so that's, that's an element uh, I think that's really important in an energy transition about how we develop good conversations about the future. Um, and the last point I wanted to make was um, the nuance around value, a value uh, in, in our Electricity system, network prices are flat. Uh, we haven't explored, you know, use of the network when it forces new capacity, use, use of underutilised assets and the difference in value uh, that those things give us. So, um, and that those point right back to where some of the network reforms and, and unlocking price. I noticed, Marnie, that you've, you've talked in, in the chat area about knocking... Um, distribution use of service charges down to a layered thing where we think about the real local costs and the, the um, maybe the 11 kV compared to the, the 240 volt system. Um, and that's obviously, that sort of thinking would require a whole lot of reforms in the system. So my last question for you guys is, who are the stakeholders for your research? Do they really get it? Do they get the importance of the future, the, the unknownness and the community needing to be part of this conversation and these sort of electricity reforms. Thank you. Hope I didn't talk too much there. Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so now I'd like to call on our other discussant, Rob Thorman. Rob is the Program Manager for Sustainability and Release Coordination in Suburban Land Agency in the ACT Government. Uh, so over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, and we're really so excited to be uh, involved in this discussion and in a wider uh, emerging partnership that we're developing with the ANU. Um, just a, a little bit about the Suburban Land Agency. We are the ACT government's land development agency. We do both greenfields estates and uh, urban infill sites. Um, but we sit within the ACT government, so we're guided by the ACT government's uh, policy framework, including targets around um, renewable energy and zero emissions suburbs into the future. So it's an exciting area to be working in. Um, we're looking at opportunities for potentially a number of pilots at different scales, but at the moment we're really focusing on the, um, the suburb of Jacker. Uh, above my shoulder on the ironing board is a uh, plan of the suburb that I've brought in from the office and it's a it's about uh, 700 
dwellings. So it's a, it's a good size to be looking at um, piloting um, the potential for community-based batteries. So I might step back a little bit and look at some of the initiatives that we have taken in the past. Um, going back quite a few years, we've uh, incentivised solar hot water systems through rebates or mandating. Um, more recently in the ACT, we've had the experience of Demon Prospect, which mandated solar PV in their estates, but that led to the unforeseen uh, situation where too much energy was coming out of the suburb, and uh, which was a, a concern to uh, the energy network. Um, so in the next suburb that we were developing in Malongolo Valley in Whitlam, we've looked at uh, rebates for PV, but working with Evo Energy to make sure that the network was able to deal with the increased flow of energy coming into the system. Um, but we started looking ahead to the next suburb. Can we be designing the whole suburb so there's more economies of scale? The sort of, uh, the sort of things that Marnie touched on. Um, and so we've started in the planning stage of JACA to look at um, battery storage at, at community uh, suburban scale. Um, what does that look like in a technical sense? Do we have a number of small batteries located with substations around the suburb? Um, and that's something we're actively engaged with at the moment, working with Evo Energy, uh, with the ANU and the, our our uh, estate design consultants. But um, one of the other issues though uh, that um, a few of the speakers today have touched on is the whole governance issue. What, what is our role as a land developer? Usually we develop the land, we sell it, and we do some social programs afterwards, but basically we move on. So if we're going to be setting up this bit of infrastructure, um, it's not generally our role to stay involved after the suburb is completed so how do we uh, go out to tender for a, a third party to run the system and what are the benefits that the system potentially provides so there's certainly network benefits and uh, i think there's a growing awareness of that within the um the network operators that we can potentially through there can be services provided by our community-based batteries that can reduce peak load issues, um, so to sort of help manage the network. There's also uh, benefits for our customers, the people who are purchasing um, land in our estates. So we want to be able to offer cheaper electricity. Um, so whether we, whether we mandate that people put PV on or offer incentives or whether we're basically offering um, something that's too good to refuse, like you buy into Jacker, it's part of our, our marketing. Uh, you buy into this suburb and you, you, you're you part of this um, sort of sense of greater reliance uh, or self-reliance in the suburb, but also the, the financial benefits. So these are some of the issues that we're working through at the moment. So we are part, as, as a government land organisation, we're part of a network uh, of government land organisations around the country. and um, yes, it's interesting to watch what's going on with similar organisations to ours around the country. Uh, as has been mentioned, Western Australia is leading the way. Uh, Alcomos was mentioned as an example. That, that's a project by our counterparts over there. Um, there's another one at Nutsford. Uh, and we're a little bit envious that they're able to uh, enter into these projects because they operate under different energy rules. So the question that Marnie posed, are we able to uh, deliver community-based battery storage program in the East Coast, we certainly want to prove that that's possible and be part of, uh, of demonstrating that through, through a pilot. So I think I'll leave it at, for there at the moment, Ken. If there's any further questions, we can address them later. Terrific, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, so now is the time for the panel to have a bit of a discussion amongst themselves. And, uh, and maybe I'd like to guide the conversation a little bit uh, in the direction of this local governance question, which seems to be a theme. Uh, and I'd like to hear from uh, both Hedda and from Marnie uh, on their perspectives on that. Uh, you know, obviously uh, there is an element of social contract here. So, um, you know, people need to enter into 
a social contract with their neighbours. As Rob just said, maybe if you move into a new suburb where this uh, type of capability uh, pre-exists, uh, you are automatically signing up to a social contract in some sense. So I'd like to hear uh, from, from Heather and Marnie the key questions that Heather uh, asked and Rob asked in that context. Who'd like to go first? I go first, Heather. <laughs> um, so I think you, you have both sort of hit the exact, um, you know, benefit and, and complexity of the idea of community batteries, which is who, who, um, who are they for? So we, at the beginning of this project, we were discussing among ourselves, what does it mean to have a community battery? Is it still a community battery if it's sitting on the network, but there's no relationship between the battery and the customers. The customers don't even know about the battery, but it still serves a, an important purpose for the network. So um, for us, we say that community battery in some way benefits the community. Either they um, own it or they are involved in the management of the battery or they directly benefit from the battery. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's all this tension between you know, whether the battery is there for the community or if the battery is there for the, for the network operator pr to provide grid support. Um, it, it sort of gets at the very heart of the fact that the battery benefits a lot of different people. So how you actually um, put it in in practice, who owns it and who operates it, depends how much, that, um, how much of a slice of the pie each of those groups get the network versus the the community um, versus the owner of the battery. Like, did you have anything else to add, Heda, to that question? Oh yeah, no, there were fantastic, um, fantastic reflections there, and I, I agree with you know a lot of what Heather's raised, and um, I suppose just. For those of you who, who don't know, Eleanor Ostrom is um, a Nobel Prize winning economist who, um, who did some work looking, up, looking at the management of the commons and you know, her key argument is that there's not one institution that ever gets it right. Um, government, the market, communities have all failed at managing um, the, the commons at, at various points. And um, so looking at a set of principles for how to manage the commons is a more sort of useful way to think about um, how we do this moving forward. And, um, and her work has been applied in a lot of different contexts and has been found to be true and relevant across, again, a lot of contexts, this idea that, um, you know, having faith in the market or the government or um, the community is is not um, necessarily the most useful way forward. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of potential to think about um, think about the battery, think about the electricity system more broadly as a commons. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very interested in having more conversations with people about that. And I did a little bit of work um, for six councils south of Adelaide. Um, and when I was looking at local governance and, and local systems, one of the um, models that appealed was uh, Bendigo Bank. So their community banks are actually, they actually have the force of the big guy sitting behind them. Uh, and they, they, I imagine that could be your network has a relationship with a community battery and provides a lot of the, the technical support and the backup. But in these community banks, they actually have local ownership and, and local operation and local purpose. Um, and they're in places that Bendigo Bank doesn't want to hold a bank anymore. So it it's, thrives on the value that the community wants that bank there. And I thought, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's the model that might you know, we could dip our toe in the water with uh, networks are being forced to be a lot more consultative, but they're not being forced to be um, specific to individual communities. But what would it look like if they started to interact with communities in some sort of governance format that, uh, that helps drive what communities want? 
And the ownership thing sits at the heart of this. You know, everyone throws up their hands and says, networks can't own this. Um, I, one of the community energy groups I work for is Karina, and we give interest-free loans to uh, community buildings. Well, why wouldn't you put your community battery on your community building and, and build around that space um, exactly what you need to, sort of, to help the network, to, to help the community in emergencies, all those sorts of things you could bring together if you imagined it that way. Can I um, just come in here as well? One of the challenges that we've got um, is when we go out to the market to find a um, operator of the, of the battery system that we set up, there are going to be multiple multiple benefits. There's going to be benefits to the network. There's going to be benefits to the community who move into the estate. There's also going to be the ability of the operator to make money on the uh, through arbitrage, the, the, the short-term fluctuations in the, in the energy network. Um, how do we put together a package when we go out to market? Who, who are going to be the primary beneficiaries of the battery storage? How do we balance that? How do we develop a set of criteria to go out to find a, a participant? And this is something we're wanting to do a little bit of research on to look at what are the different costs and benefits and how maybe we, we might even have to design the network in a different way. It may be that um, small batteries throughout the suburb works really well for the energy network, but for someone who's operating the system to make money, it may be better to have a larger battery. So we, we, even before we design the technical aspects, we need to sort out some of those, those governance issues and the, the, the costs and benefits to various participants. You have to show the world how to do it, Rob. <laughs> Thanks, Marnie. We'll do that together. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, just one more uh, question for the panel before we go to the general questions, and we're building up uh, dozens of those. Um, so uh, as we know, the, uh, there has been a COAG uh, paper released about uh, two-sided markets, and, uh, and this is to address uh, the problem of curtailment of solar uh, which is happening as we speak. So this is not uh, a theoretical uh, issue, it's a real problem. Um, so uh, is there uh, a way in which uh, this discussion around community batteries can inform uh, the curtailment issues? And indeed, uh, how do we go about injecting this into the uh, two-way market uh, or the two-sided market discussion? Um, so I guess the, the two-sided market is really about trying to pay customers for the service that they're providing to the grid um, in the right way. I mean, at the moment, solar exporters are getting paid a feed-in tariff, um, and sometimes that's not a fair payment because they're actually um, causing more issues for the, for the grid. Um, than they should be paid for. So it's about trying to work out what is the appropriate amount of money to pay the customers for, uh, for the service that they're either providing or being provided with. Um, and the way the batteries fit in is making better use of the energy services that the customers can provide. So rather than, you know, the customers are producing all this solar PV, it's too much and we have to just curtail it. It's better to actually make the best use of that, CV, uh, of that PV, put it into the battery to use later on in the afternoon um, or in the evening. So I, I see that the battery fits in really well with the two-sided market. Um, yeah, and you also don't really need, I mean, yeah, you can. You could argue all day about the the changes to the market that are required, but um, I see that the battery could fit in with with either model because it's really about just making the best use of the service that the customer can provide for the grid. Okay. So, uh, community energy system in Denmark. Um, it had two wind turbines, a cogeneration plant, some solar hot water, a big hot water tank to use surplus energy. It was doing it for a town of 300 people. And the operator of that plant 
was still fairly naive about how he was acting uh, with the market because he was going through an aggregator. So in fact, the technical expertise that he had to operate um, and, and optimise was still, it was enough, but it wasn't big market looking and it certainly wasn't, um, th this is so available to everyday people. So I, I think the two-way grid is interesting. Obviously, we, we might get there and, and that might be the thing, but the, the very centralised nature of it might, um, might make it a game that 10% of our population plays, but the other 90% just ignore. Uh, and down at the local level, there's still plenty of value to go find. So uh, I, I'm intrigued. Very good. Well, on that note, uh, we might now move to questions from the audience. And as I said, there are lots of those. Uh, we'll continue uh, answering questions after one o'clock. But if those of you wish to leave then uh, would like to do so, then that's, uh, that's all good. Um, so uh, let's go back to uh, some of the earlier questions. Um, uh, so we have a question here from Mark Ballesteros, uh, who asks, do the results to date for the community battery at Alchemos in WA support the modelled results, both economic tech and technical, that you're getting? Um, that's a great question. Thanks to Mark. Um, we, we are, we've just started speaking with, with the people who, who are running that battery, so I can't answer for sure. It must be working technically well because they're rolling out another 10 or so batteries um, over the coming year. So um, technically, for sure, it's doing the job. Um, economically, I'm, I'm unsure, but that, that's a good idea that, that we should follow up with them. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so Hamish McKenzie says, if a regional town in the NEM were to develop a feasibility study for a community-owned battery, is it possible to do that study or even actually construct and operate a grid-connected battery without policy change to allow sale of electricity to the grid? Um, so, um, sort of, <laughs> so they, uh, you know, to sell electricity to the grid, you have to be a licensed retailer, obviously. So, so you have to, um, fit the bill to, to be able to apply to, to become one of those retailers. Um, so it's not such an issue with selling electricity to and from the grid, from your battery. What's a little bit more, uh, what probably needs a rule change in the near term is if you want to buy and sell energy from customers to the battery, um, it would work a lot better if we could reduce the price that's charged to transport that energy. Um, at the moment, it's the same price whether you're transporting, you know, from my house to the neighbour or from my house to Queensland. So if you could reduce that price to be uh, reduce, then that would incentivize the buying and selling of the energy locally to and from the battery. So we, what we see in our modeling is if we don't have that um, energy transport price, which is called DUOS, if we don't have it reduced, then it doesn't, doesn't really work as a battery for customers. Um, but I, actually, I'll just add that that, that is a um, slated rule change. So it's, it's possibly going to change in the near future. Sorry, Heda. Oh, just to quickly add that that's exactly what our participants told us, who the, the kind of participants um, that we're exploring these options. And, um, and I guess this comes back to the kind of the value of trials and demonstrations and, and sort of regulatory sandpits because you can sort of um, hold off on some of these um, on some of these rules and then sort of see what happens. And um, and, and people really um, value, <coughs> sorry, people really value that. They, they really value the sort of um, seeing something tangible, not just the kind of abstract modeling, which is important and it's important groundwork. But we heard sort of time and time again that, that there's nothing more convincing than an actual sort of, yep, seeing a battery is working. Like, you know, we've already talked about Alchemos Beach a few times. Um, so the power of a, of a demonstration. And the community energy sector in Victoria have been advocating for a feed-in tariff targeted at that exact problem, right? If you build, if your community energy 
group build an, an appropriately scaled generator for your town? Um, why should it get tangled up with only getting half the value because really it is doing the network value and it, it shouldn't have to miss out on that value of network charges as well. Okay, very good. So uh, coming up to this social contract question, there's a question here from Ellen Roberts, which is interesting. So it says, what are the options for non-solar households accessing energy storage in a community battery? Are there models for that anywhere or overseas? Mm. Solar gardens model. Um, sorry, Marnie, do you want to go first? No, you go, Heather. You go. The, the solar gardens model um, in the US works perfectly fine because local government own the system and they are the retailer and they say, I'm going to offset this um, electricity from your solar panel with your bill, which even though the solar panel is in a different location to the bill. And um, Uni of New South Wales or um, UTS, one of those, uh, has been doing a bunch of work um, on trying to look at solar gardens in Australia, but it, it points back to the reforms end of things, um, depending on how you structure the project. So Anova in New South Wales, which is a small community owned retailer in the Northern Rivers, have put the solar panels inside a customer premises and they, as a retailer, they have the freedom to say, this solar panel owns to you, it belongs to you and you are a customer on my network, so I'll just trade those off. Um, but they had to do it behind the meter to make it work uh, amongst, uh, within the rules of the NEM as it stands. Yeah, maybe I'll just add one thing, which is um, the battery in Alcamos Beach and some other models that have been talked about are the type where you um, allocate for each customer a certain capacity of the battery, say 10 kilowatt hours or so. So then you would need to have solar PV to store in the community battery to use later. So that's one model. But there's, there are other models where you wouldn't have to have solar PV. You could just have a trading relationship with the battery. I'll just really quickly just add that um, I'm seeing a few questions about sort of looking at overseas and what's happening overseas. Um, I think we have to remember that we are really world leading and that the technological imperative that's sort of pushing the community battery idea to be um, or one of is um, to be a viable option is is the kind of the parts of the network that have um, such a high density of, of PV on them and that's you know where we're sort of world leading in that in that regard um, so for instance with the social research I only found one other study um, in the UK actually about what is it you know what do people think of the shared uh, battery kind of concept so um, I think we have to stop looking overseas. I think we have to just um, look look to us and look to, to finding solutions in Australia. Although I think it's fair to say that while we're world leading with uh, PV installations and maybe batteries and other things, uh, community-based renewable energy overseas is actually well ahead of Australia in terms of adoption. Germany is a wonderful example of that, but Denmark and you can look at lots of places. We're not so good in Australia on the community aspects of things so far at least um, and these studies that we're talking about today are really pathfinders in a sense for us. Yeah I'd just like to quickly add on that because it's something that actually came came up within the data within within the focus groups and it's something that I've subsequently went out to sort of experts in in citizen um, deliberation in, in Australia. We have some world leading experts on this topic, even at ANU, Carolyn Hendricks, for example. And so just, I was just really curious to see this in the data that people didn't really have a lot of faith in, in community. And so people actually talked about, oh, in Germany, they're doing community energy. Maybe this is something that Australian culture, this is something that we can't, we can't do. Um, and so I just, I think this is something that's really interesting that's come from the data um, and sort of explains why people go, oh, local government's a good option. Um, but, you know, community energy, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure about this idea of kind of community um, driving, driving this. So something that I'd like to kind of, kind of look, look a bit more into. Um, yeah, well picked up, Ken. Thank you. Mm. Um, let's move on to another question. Um, so uh, there's a question uh, here from... Um, 
uh, from uh, uh, John Pemberton. Uh, so John asks, Hedo, have you tested community reaction to possible peer-to-peer -peer trading? Um, uh, this I feel would be welcome if it could be enabled with sensible poles and wires access rules. Um, ask about peer-to-peer -peer trading specifically within our focus groups because our, our focus was was really on the sort of shared battery and that was there was already so much to talk about. Um, you know, I had to cut people off at the one hour plus mark often. Um, but yeah, sort of emerged organically, this idea of peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, one participant sort of said that that was something that he would really like to do because he owns a couple, well, particularly because he owns a couple of properties. Um, so this idea of, um, you know, s sort of selling selling his excess or giving his excess energy to his, his other property. Um, and microgrids, um, which is a, you know, focus of Heather's work, um, came up also organically. Um, it's a, people didn't always use that term, but this idea of, Sometimes they use this language of kind of federated um, uh, sort of bits of the network um, came up, which I thought was interesting. And I just to re-emphasize this point that, you know, people have ideas about energy futures. Um, Heather says we need to have this conversation. And I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, they're not just a blank slate that, um, you know, we in the energy sector need to do all the work and think up the solutions for the for the for the energy future. People um, have ideas um, and some really exciting and original ideas. I think about what what that could look like. Okay, so uh, we have a question uh, from John Soderbaum, uh, and uh, and maybe Rob could have some input into this. Maybe Heather and others. Um, did you find any difference in community views between community batteries being retrofitted to an existing community versus those being integrated into a new plan development. So in other words, you know, uh, having a social contract on top of what is already there or a social contract when you enter into a community. Mm. Yeah, well, just from, from the perspective of the land, develop, uh, land developer, um, it's far preferable to do it at the, from the outset to um, the idea, well, we, as an, as an entity, we wouldn't be involved in retrofitting. That would be something that would, um, yeah, be, and it would be quite a disruptive process, I would imagine. When we design a suburb, you're integrating all of the different infrastructure in the planning and, and how the water, the sewer, the uh, electricity, the um, IT connections, all of that works with your footpaths, your roads. Um, so it's, it's far more economical to do it at, at the outset um, and to sort out these governance issues in advance. So I, I probably can't talk on the retrofitting, but I would say um, that, yeah, it's far preferable to do it in a, like in a greenfield situation from the outset. And Heather, what about the community attitudes uh, on those two? Yeah, it pretty, pretty agrees with sort of, a, I mean, like everybody was, was keen but people definitely thought that it would be like had the idea oh yeah if it's a new development that would be easier people understood intuitively that greenfield sites would be um and our energy sector professionals mentioned that as well greenfield sites are obviously um a really you know if you're looking at sort of low-hanging fruit that that would be the place to start and so it's not a coincidence that that rob's exploring this this option hmm. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, am I still off mute? Yeah. The other thing is the design of the individual houses. So it's not only the layout of the estate, but if if you're starting with the vision with the outset at the outset to uh, that this is going to be an integral part of the suburb, we make sure we've got north facing roof planes, how the buildings relate to each other. So you're designing not only the estate but the built form uh, uh, from the outset. I guess just quickly to add then, um, I guess the differences you could see would be that <clears throat> rural people sort of didn't have an issue about space. Um, within an urban context, people did mention that, you know, land um, land value and finding location could be an issue. Um, so, you know, people were did express, a couple of people did express some concerns about property prices and mentioned, you know, Petrol, if you you know if you've got a house next to a petrol station, that that brings down the value. Um, <clears throat> so people were kind of conscious of that. Um, 
there is, I suppose, a prospect of we, we have heard of, of the idea of kind of building them underground, which would reduce the kind of visual um, impact. Another community member sort of talked about, um, you know, using it as an opportunity for some community artworks. Um, so, you know, I think people will relate to the battery differently depending on, again, how the community is kind of evolved, involved in that process of, of, um, of installation. Okay, we might move to another question. So Jessica Stewart asks a question about scale, and I think Marnie, you touched on this very early in the piece. Um, so in terms of the, the, not only the size of the community, but the size of the battery that we're talking about here, uh, is there some issue regarding viability when it comes to the, the actual physical uh, size of the, of the system that is being uh, used by a, by a group sharing a, a facility like this? In other words, you know, can you do this with lots of small scale, you know, pad mount substation systems, or do you have, you know, 10 megawatt size batteries dealing with lots of people? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I guess, I mean, the sort of batteries that we're talking about here, which are trading with um, local customers, we're really looking at putting the battery on the low voltage network and that decision impacts the ultimate scale of the battery. So um, if it's on the low voltage network, then you're probably limited to on the order of um, a few megawatt, megawatt hour, um, say one to three. Um, but yeah, if it's, if it's on the medium voltage network or, or above, then you can have a larger battery. Obviously that brings benefits because the bigger the battery, the more money you can make trading on the energy market. And what we see, which is interesting from our results um, for the cost benefits is that the batteries um, make the most money from the FCAS market at the moment. Uh -huh. The FCAS market is very lucrative at the moment. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to it in the future. So you, you probably wouldn't want to bank on it. Um, but at the moment, that's, that's high, very lucrative. So the bigger the battery, the more money you can make in that way. So I, yeah, if I was buying one myself, I'd try to get the biggest <laughs> I could put on, um, on the low voltage network if, if that's where you, know, you need it to, to provide the network service. Yeah, it's, that, always, that... it's a matter of pricing the service that the battery can provide appropriately. Right. And, that, and that's true. I mean, the Tesla battery in South Australia makes a lot of money out of frequency control. So, uh, so that's true. So this yeah. touches on a question um, that uh, we had earlier um, from Chris Wallen. Um, so was there any discussion with the, the people that you talked to about uh, the income coming potentially from frequency regulation, the FCAS market, in addition to the arbitrage, the storage of energy for sale at a later time? So did that become part of the discussion or was that just completely outside the, the scope of what you uh, considered? Is that a question for Hedda about what people thought in, or in, about our models? In particular for Hedda. Oh, look, yeah. Um, the questions that we asked were relatively open-ended um, because, um, because of the kind of uh, potential for these these sorts of models to, to do more or less anything. Um, so yeah, FCAS um, certainly came up, um, and and this is what and this is why it came down to sort of different models, different benefits. If you're designing a model to make the most money, then um, you know then that has governance implications about who who owns the battery and who runs the battery and all these kinds of things. So. They, they can't, we can't sort of untangle all of these, all of these questions um, around value and governance and ownership. Um, within uh, the community, there was definitely a couple of energy sort of, uh, you know, enthusiasts who, you know, love the idea of kind of trading um, themselves in, within the electricity market. Um, they were really sort of engaged. Um, and then other people were really sort of against the market-based thinking. Um, I think the extent of suspicion and scepticism about privatisation is something that we haven't probably talked about enough within the energy conversation. Um, pretty much every focus group people talked about uh, concerns that they had with privatisation, marketisation, 
of energy which they saw as an essential service. So they made um, analogies with public transport, with water. Um, so um, I guess, you know, when you start talking about these kind of market approaches, people respond very differently. Some people, a minority I would say, are comfortable with the idea, um, but then a lot of people just um, uh, sort of, almost I would say, they use the word political, they use the word ideological, they sort of like that question about is this a social good? Is this an individual good? People even sort of one participant even used the term, you know, are we commies or are we capitalists? Um, you know, so all we asked was what do you think about local storage? And we got these incredibly rich responses around the governance of the energy system. Um, and, you know, you'll have to read the report to <laughs> get more of a, get more detail, more of an insight and some really great quotes um, from people. And it certainly surprised me that the, the level of um, feeling on this issue, um, maybe it doesn't surprise Heather, but um, uh, yeah. So Marnie, in the model, did you include any FCAS income in that or was it purely arbitrage? So I include FCAS when the, the battery is allowed, is owned by someone who can make money through FCAS. Mm -hmm. So there, I basically look at four models. Two models are owned by a third party, um, which could be a local council or a community group or a private operator. And they, those people can make money from FCAS. Um, and I look at two models that are owned by a network and then and the network is not allowed to, to trade but what, what would be an interesting model, and I, I actually do include this, the network can lease a part of the battery to a third party to do trading on FCAS. So the short answer is yes, we look at FCAS. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now uh, let's uh, talk about um, uh, you know, this question of uh, at what level does government get involved? Uh, so Lisa Stiebel asks uh, about the regulatory barriers that are, need to be addressed before uh, you can deploy community batteries in the NEM um, and ask, are there state-by-state -state differences? And then I'll link this with another question from Marion Ray, which is, is there a role for the federal government or at least for COAG Energy Ministers uh, meetings uh, in trying to uh, uh, operationalise uh, community batteries as a, a real prospect? I'd like to add something to the last question that links to the state-by-state -state differences here. So um, the, if I give an example of a street transformer um, serving 80 uh, odd households and um, having voltage issues, uh, the SA Power Networks gave us three options to solve that. So this is a problem that isn't a problem until it is. And, and then it's a, it's a, uh, a short-term problem for SA Power Networks till they solve it. They could put in a, a $80,000 new line, that's $1,000 a customer. They could limit everybody's solar exports, that's um, $300 a customer. And they could put in some sort of dynamic system that just limits those exports at, at, at the peak time, which is $10 a customer. And None of that discussion has talked about the other half of the residents who don't have solar on their roofs but might like it. So the cost of that problem is unevenly shared. It's, at the moment, it's being mainly caused by the, the, problem, the person furthest away from the street transformer has the biggest voltage issues. So they've got the biggest problem. Um, so so the, the way those problems are unevenly shared across the community is quite important. Now, to bring back to the question about local differences, even within the same regulatory regime, the different networks are grappling with these problems in different ways. And so that's uh, giving a different experience if you are trying to put a community battery in different network areas. Any other comments? Um, I just wanted to add that um, with respect to federal um, policy, so the Energy Security Board, um, which is a COAG group, they are actively looking at um, this and related issues. So they're looking at the issues of how do we reprice the market, like the two-way market that you were talking about, Ken. Um, and also they are look actively looking 
looking at community batteries and community scale storage. So yeah, it's all, it's all marching forward as you would hope. Good. Well, we've still got around 150 people online, so we might keep going with the questions a little longer. Um, so uh, we have a question uh, here from Aaron Midson, uh, who talks about uh, life cycle environmental issues. Okay, so uh, in other words, uh, what about uh, the management of these community battery systems at the end of their life? Uh, how does battery disposal work? Uh, what is the average lifetime of community batteries? You know, who deals with the environmental um, fallout from, uh, from you know, uh, the, the battery uh, technology that needs to then be uh, somehow ameliorated? And then, of course, there's replacement, you know. Who does the maintenance and the replacement and all the rest of it and to make this an ongoing proposition? And is this an issue that we push straight into the electricity industry as having to deal with? Because we're starting to see solar panels um, being dumped uh, from the first wave of our solar panel investments. Um, and we're only just starting to see the waste regulators deal with what is that back end of the life issues that they need to, to deal with. So I think there's all of these sustainability life cycle questions need to be embedded in our systems a little bit better right from the start. But of course, we could say that about carbon emissions and just get ourselves sunk into a debate we don't need to have on this webinar. <laughs> I can hear the um, pumped hydro and the hydro people saying, this is why you should use just hydro for storage because you have a much longer life cycle. But um, I mean, one thing to point out is that there, there's quite a lot of research into repurposing of batteries. So even within our program, um, we're looking at repurposing batteries after they've been used up in electric vehicles um, and then recycling of batteries. So that doesn't answer the question to who pays for it, but there's certainly, um, it's not like you finish up and um, chuck it away. It's, it's recycled and repurposed. Just to quickly add that I agree with Heather, I think, um, you know, this needs, needs to be institutionalised and, um, and it's a really live issue for the community. There's enough awareness about battery toxicity and um, <clears throat> it, was, um, it was definitely sort of up there with probably the biggest concern that people had with the idea, despite all the enthusiasm. Um, so, you know, um, I think just like we're seeing with COVID, you know, the role of government is being reimagined as changing is changing um, in this context because of a, of a pandemic. But I suppose, you know, you can see the energy transition in a similar sort of way as, as a challenge to, to the roles of the various kind of actors in the system. And, uh, and that's certainly one that I think is, is pretty key in terms of community batteries. Um, so we have another question from Vivian Griffith, who's uh, moving the discussion a little bit away from kind of residential communities to uh, more uh, business communities. So would a community battery uh, also work in, in, let's say, an industrial estate where there's a, you know, a single major landlord and lots and lots of different uh, uh, renters that utilise that, uh, that particular industrial estate? Uh, could this be applied to the commercial and industrial sector as well as the residential sector? Perhaps I'll have a go at that. Um, I mean, in some ways that can make it a lot easier because if the battery's behind the meter, then it's, um, it's a lot more straightforward because you don't have to worry about the energy that's being um, charged and discharged to the battery being settled on the NIM. Um, on the other hand, if you have customers um, that the battery is serving behind that meter, um, so what we call embedded networks, then it, it becomes uh, complex again, because we have a rule that customers are, have the right to choose who they buy their electricity from. So you can't have set up a system where people are locked in to, to not having a choice about, about where they buy their electricity from. Mm -hmm. but, um, but really, yeah, the, com the com 
complexities come when you put the battery in front of the meter. That's where we, we have to start looking at regulation change. In the embedded networks space, I mean, we know we've got lots of, even just an individual building with lots of tenants in it. Um, I'm quite interested that the market model has been some of these uh, professional billing companies who take on board all the energy um, issues in your embedded network. Uh, we've seen the regulator come in recently and try to tighten the experience for a tenant in an embedded network versus a normal residential customer so that those embedded network operators are held to the same standards. But one of my criticisms of these billing companies is they've never done any of the big value for residents, value for tenants work that they could do on energy efficiency and demand management and the things that could make the whole much cheaper for everybody or a little bit cheaper for everybody. Now, is that because that's just hard work or is it because they're set up from the wrong incentive point to start off with and so there's not enough um, how, to, how to get that value into the system and, and have it recognised by everybody? Very good. So uh, we might uh, now move towards uh, the final question and... Uh, this is a, a, a bit of an interesting uh, research question we have from Bob Webb. Um, so he's talking about understanding the community view. Uh, and uh, he asks, how do you get the voice of the broader and perhaps maybe not as well informed uh, community uh, on, uh, on these uh, questions and issues, uh, as opposed to maybe people who are enthusiastic and kind of want to do this sort of thing anyway? How do you how do you tap into wider community understanding and and uh, and uh, uh, you know a decision making uh, to adopt this sort of thing rather than uh, concentrate on people who are already partly in the game at least. Yeah. Now, uh, recruitment is obviously a, a big a big topic in um, these sort of re research methodologies that we're we're doing. Um, so for our study, we, um, we gave a $50 gift voucher. It sounds like a very sim simple um, thing, sort of a Woolies $50 gift voucher, but that's been found fairly consistently to kind of reduce that, um, that risk of just sort of the, the enthusiasts coming along. And I, I would certainly say, based on quite a few of our focus groups, um, that, you know, we had, we had good representation of people who, you know, um, didn't know very much about energy, um, and yes, we had the keen beans along, but we wanted the keen beans as well because keen beans have solar um, and so our, our prospective kind of users of something like this shared battery. So I suppose in terms of more broadly your question about sort of ways forward, um, you might have heard of kind of terms like citizens' juries um, or deliberative democracy or town hall or mini publics. Um, there are a lot of kind of really um, interesting um, and by now quite well established sort of um, citizens engagement type um, formats that require organisation, great facilitation resources. Um, so you might have heard, um, not sure what it's up to at the moment, but there was um, a sort of a citizens jury process happening in France at a national scale. Um, to explore um, how to tackle climate change. And in these kinds of contexts, people are randomly selected to get a broad representation across the community. People are paid for their time. They are given information from experts and time to deliberate um, over sort of maybe even a series of months. Um, so you just Google sort of, um, or there's a Participedia, in fact, is a kind of Wikipedia of examples of innovations where citizens are sort of involved in decision making. This is not something that's um, terribly new. We've been doing it for quite a while now. Um, and I think, I think the energy sector is kind of poised to do a lot more of it, actually. We had a citizens jury in the ACT run by a local um, expert on deliberative democracy um, uh, on, on gas. So you can also Google that and check out, you know, what it is that people um, you know, came up with some recommendations on, on that. Um, so, yeah, I hope I've, I've answered that question. Um, I've got a couple of points I'd like to make on that. Um, as a land developer, we sell land to basically two groups. It's the, uh, 
in purchases, individuals and families, and uh, and to developers. Um, and so there's different um, different messages and different motivations. Um, what we found in the market research that we've been doing leading up to our um, incentives package for Whitlam was people generally want to do the right thing about the environment, but it, it's very complex. There's a lot of decisions. and uh, So what we found is providing the information, making it easy for them. So we've come up with a package of, so you get a rebate, so there's a financial incentive. You get a $10,000 rebate if you put in five kilowatts of PV, um, electric heating and cooking, electric charge point for an EV um, an EV charge point in the garage and um, the other the other thing is an energy management system. So that's a package. We've done the research um, and we've made it easy for people and we've given them a financial incentive. In terms of the community battery, I think the biggest thing for to get to everybody is it just makes economic sense. You're going to it's going to save you money. Um, and if if that's I mean that's going to be where we really make a difference when we can demonstrate to people that it's not only good for the environment, but it's going to save money um, in, in terms of your energy bills ongoing. And that's really important with the people we're dealing with because they're about to, in, you know, take out big loans. They've, they're going to buy a piece of land and then go through the building process. And there's always going to be that sort of value management exercise as, you know, is it the, is it the kitchen bench top or, the sustainability feature that I'm going to put money in. So you really need to be able to address it from a financial perspective and from the developer's perspective as well. Like one of our challenges is, are they going to put in an ongoing energy inefficient hot water system that's cheaper up front or how do we incentivize or mandate um, in something that might cost a little bit more up front, but the long-term running costs are, are lower. So yeah, there's different, different targets or ways of targeting those those different um, our customers, basically. Thanks. Very good. So we might uh, leave it there. Uh, we're after one thirty now, and uh, although we still have 100 or so people on the line, uh, I think this has been a terrific discussion. Uh, we've had uh, uh, well over 300 participants, I noticed there, and, uh, and, and so that's been a a great uh, opportunity to get some of the research that we do here in the Energy Change Institute out there uh, and to discuss some key issues on energy matters that, uh, that the wider community are interested in hearing. So uh, let me thank again our two speakers, Heather Ranson Cooper and Marnie Shaw, our two discussants, Heather Smith and Rob Thorman. And uh, let me thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. And we look forward to your participation uh, not only in uh, our energy conversations, which we hold uh, quarterly, uh, we do this uh, in uh, collaboration with the Australian uh, Institute of Energy, uh, but also in the uh, seminar series that the Energy Change Institute runs. Uh, and you'll see this on our website. We'll be uh, looking at, uh, at putting uh, some more topics uh, out there, not just in our own research, but in other areas as well in the, in the coming months. So thank you all very much for participating and we look forward to seeing you uh, at our next uh, webinar. Thank you all.